Hey everyone, we're ready to get started. Okay. I'm Max Crawford. Uh, I'm here to talk to you today about video a very brief history of video game UX. Uh, I have been in the industry for the last decade, uh, both as a developer and a designer and as a researcher, analytics, really wore a lot of different hats um, through a couple different agencies. And then for the last seven months, I've been working with Mozilla uh, as a front engineer. So I've had lots of different touch points, um, all the while running Tulsa UX, uh, which has been a really good outlet just to bring in other people and kind of advance the whole community's knowledge set. So uh, it's been really exciting. You can find more about me at my simple website, maxcrawford.com, or on Twitter for terrible tweets uh, I wouldn't worship. So quick author's note, uh, this is hyper subjective. Uh, pretty much games that I like or knew about. Uh, there's a lot other games out there, uh, so definitely let me know if I don't cover your favorite so that I can add to this, which has already done. I've already added stuff to it just from people saying, why not this game? So uh, this is a little bit more interactive talk, so feel free, I will ask you to yell stuff out uh, to kind of see uh, what we're all thinking. So, uh, real quick, what makes good UX in a video game? Does anyone have any opinions on that? <laughs> Easy to figure out. Anything else? Think about Adult. what? Adult. Hot dog. That's the that's the number one word on there. Is in, intuitive. We got it. Uh, high score. Uh, <laughs> so. Uh, I've broken down good video game UX into four kind of specific areas. The first being uh, intuitive. Uh, this needs to be easy to understand and use. That discoverability and learnability to a video game is what's going to draw people in at the very beginning, which in any kind of storytelling setting is going to keep them present throughout the rest of the game by having that learning moments uh, happen easily and accessibly. Uh, in addition to that, it needs to be immersive. So your UI needs to be in context of the game and actually make you feel, add to the experience of whatever story you're telling. In addition to that, uh, a lot of your messaging has to be consistent. So if you present a certain action in a certain way, it needs to be consistent throughout all the screens or iterations of that. Again, aiding to discoverability and learning of it, they need to know if I look here, this is where that information is going to be, especially in in some specific games, your reaction is specific, so you need to be able to look at that quickly and go back to it. And then finally, it needs to have uh, some fun factor. Uh, I, it's video games, that there's, it's for entertainment purposes, so that's important to remember at the end of the day uh, that you maintain that sense of delight. So uh, let's get started. Uh, we're gonna look at some screenshots from games. There'll be some points to be like, hey, what do you notice? And you can yell stuff out too, so I'll, again, keep a keep this as a two-way conversation, even though I have a microphone. Okay, so at first, Pong, uh, the proverbial first video game. Um, it has a real bare bones uh, UI with a total of six objects on the screen total uh, to count through it. Um, what I wanted to highlight here is how they're communicating the score, uh, specifically with these two big old numbers at the top of the screen. Uh, what is missing from this UI that would be beneficial? Anything you guys see? Say it again. Both? Yeah. Um. <laughs> Every one of those is valid. <laughs> um, it's missing all the other things is pretty much it. Um, so. There's no telling what the, what the maximum score is to what the end of this game is. It's 11. There's nothing there saying that. Um, there's outside of like actual spatial positioning on the screen, you don't know if the left score represents the left pong or not. So you could do that with, it's all monochromatic right now, so there's no color inferences. Um, everything we all just said is shows up in later iterations of pong. So they made lots of different variations and they all improved on this UI. Up next, Pac-Man. Uh, who's, is everyone familiar with Pac-Man? Yeah. Cool. I'm, <laughs> yes, that's good. Thank you, Alec. <laughs> uh, 
So uh, this is where we're gonna start seeing a lot more dashboard UI uh, in the sense of having uh, pertinent information that's populated while you're, pl while you're playing. Um, specifically calling out, they have the high score and it's denoted with a label. Uh, you'll notice the score next to it doesn't have a label. However, uh, through animation, you would see it go up based on your progress through the game so you can infer through animation that it's your current score. However, there's some inconsistency with them labeling one thing and not the other. So that's definitely something when thinking through the four tenants, consistency here is kind of falling flat. In addition to that, they have uh, lives remaining. However, they're using the actual character UI. This is kind of competing tenants where you have what I would say immersiveness by utilizing the in-game person and then not actually communicating intuitively what it is. Um, so that's something that is in that gray area and this is all subjective, don't forget. Uh, <laughs> but um, the other thing I was gonna point out here is there's fruit on the bottom. I've played this game many times. I know they're worth points. I don't understand why they're there at the bottom. So that's one of those, but why? Kind of, kind of bits. Okay, E.T., the extraterrestrial, uh, panned as the worst video game in history. Uh, <laughs> what does it do? Uh, has, has anyone, who, who's familiar with this? Quick show of hands. So can someone tell me what the purple bar designates? Uh, can someone tell me what the blue bar at the bottom designates? So this is direction, hints, and available actions, um, which only has one, one area for it. Uh, and this is actually your energy life count. Um, as you move, it would slowly degrade. Again, having some animation, so there's a little bit of, by looking at these slides statically, sometimes you, we, can, we can't infer that, but know that uh, this makes no sense and <laughs> is difficult to play. All right, so the same year Tron came out. So to kind of give a variation of both on what an arcade machine could do versus an Atari 2600 home unit could do, there's definitely some graphical uh, improvements. So uh, this is the mini game select. When you start a Tron game, you can choose one of four games and they're at random. Uh, you have four quadrants separated by color. You have a countdown timer and you have a high score that's labeled as such. And then you have what level you're on based on each of those sections with some, with some titles there. Again, those change throughout each level so there's some inference through animation. Punch out. Uh, so according to Nintendo, uh, when they had the unprecedented success of Donkey Kong, they had they made this really rash decision to invest in thousands and thousands of TVs. And they had so many TVs that they asked the developers, can you please invent a game that utilizes two TVs? Because we have too many. Um, so the team decided that a two screen system could be used to make a boxing game. Uh, the reasoning is that these two screens could be used in tandem, uh, one on top of the other to uh, enhance the experience to make it feel like a real boxing match. Uh, with the fight information at the top and then the action at the bottom. And one of the real design benefits by increasing just the entire usable area of your screen, uh, you now have a much more focused area of the action. Uh, a great example here of actually using labels and being consistent about it. You can know what your score is, the bonus, uh, what round of the fight you're in, who you're playing, and then in the bottom corner, in the bottom uh, level, actually the life of your boxer, similar to all other iteration fighting games. So definitely, uh, just by having the screen capacity, they were able to increase the overall usability of the game. Duck Hunt. Uh, this is a fantastic example of immersive uh, UI and trying to put it uh, in more context. Uh, specifically, the ducks remaining actually use duck icon sym symbols. Uh, same for shots remaining uh, using bullets. Uh, again, this is a nice way visually to keep you immersed in the hunt. 
Street Fighter 2. So here we actually have a character select screen. What I really appreciate about this UI is by using color and uh, really just by using, sorry, by using color they're able to, you're able to see which, which side of the screen you're selecting. So player one is red. It has a red uh, outline around the, the, bot, the character select. And then it also uh, makes all the other nations transparent for what nation you're actually selected with. Um, but that's, this was a nice like use case compared to like Pong where everything was white. This actually has some color reference so you can see who's, who's who uh, on the selection. Uh, and then again, and similar to, you can see Punch Out uh, actually uh, uh, really Im impacting this game with having your life count here, the same health score meter, et cetera, all related here in a different capacity, but trying to share that information in a new way. Super Mario Kart. Uh, here we have, very similar to Punch Out, we have split screens and utilizing that, even though it's on your own screen, there are virtual split screens to convey competing pieces of information, including a map, uh, your place, coin count, et cetera. Uh, but again, looking for ways to designate those two areas. And then on their uh, select screen, they have a pattern that I think we've seen across lots of UI uh, in modern day, and that's confirmation. So when you select somebody, it's gonna ask if, if you're sure you wanna do that. And then one of like a UX tenant of always giving your user agency, giving your users agency to undo choices they make, this is a fantastic example of that. Doom. Uh, so this heads up display uh, for first person shooter. Uh, here what's nice is rather than having some sort of because they have so much UI crammed in the bottom, rather than doing uh, any sort of variable graphs, they're using uh, numbers to represent your life score. In addition to that, they also have the Doom guy's face gets worse and worse as you get more and more injured. They have a sprite sheet that kind of covers all of that. Uh, again, this is where immersive UI really uh, keeps you in there in the game, uh, part of a storytelling measure to show uh, how he's doing. This is an intense slide. All right, Goldeneye. So this is a fantastic example of skeuomorphism, and again, trying to place you in the game in an immersive standpoint. So the UI is a bunch of folders that when you go into it, still open up, uh, your cursor's a crosshair, et cetera. So this definitely has the making your UI look like it's IRL. Uh, even more so in game, when you pause it, uh, you look down at your watch, and they have a, a watch UI to kind of walk through the thing, including the clock in the background. Uh, one thing they do have that's really interesting that I can, as a web developer, can appreciate and hate is pagination dots at the bottom. So when you would go to slides, the squares on the bottom would light up based on the active uh, uh, slide you're on. All right, Blitz. So one thing that this sports game and other sports games did, and I think this is really, this really speaks to, again, being consistent and being intuitive, is it's using uh, real sports UI. So when you're watching football, you're expecting a, the team score, ball possession, time on clock, what quarter it is, to be made available in a little heads up display. They mirror that in game. And so from a picking the control for the first time, if you've seen football and you're playing a football game, there's, there's no barrier, there's no friction there, and you understand it. So when thinking through UI for video games, if you can mirror real life stuff, if there's context for it, it makes it very much easier to jump into. Uh, then here, just using color and border around the different plays to select uh, makes this, you know which one you're, so, what, which one you're selecting in a field of UI. Uh, this is one of those slides like ET uh, to show what lack of hierarchy can do to uh, a select screen, <laughs> you'll have things like this, where it's just, a, they could make everything clickable, so why don't we? Um, it's a mixture of being immersive <laughs> and also being unusable. <laughs> so uh, yeah, pick your battles, I guess, which is probably an even better Age of Empires joke. Uh, <laughs> 
Here, uh, again, using color selection, you can see that what they navigate through here when talking about health is when you select multiple items in the play field, you can see the health meter for each and every item you've selected uh, using both color and a level bar to show that. Uh, we've got two more and we're almost wrapping up, so we're sliding into home. Uh, Wii Sports, okay, so what's nice here uh, specifically as an intuitive game is Wii Sports was made specifically to show off what the Wii could do. It was more of a demo capabilities type game. Um, even in their getting started screen, they show the remote, they show where the buttons are and what you need to be hitting to do that. Uh, from a intuition standpoint, it was a very, I say, unintuitive because we had gone from just holding remotes to now being able to move with your hands. Having this sort of level of direction made this really accessible to all ages. Um, and additionally, this also crossed language barriers by just doing this, by just having the, the AB pressing and showing people how to, how to touch it. Um, here from a consistency standpoint, they had a nice hover effect that would show up anytime you hovered over any of the items. Again, knowing what's selected. If you get through one screen, you understand how the selection works. Uh, and this is where consistency can really pay off. Uh, and then finally, we have Grand Theft Auto 4. Uh, from an immersive standpoint, when you wanted to change stuff in the menu, you didn't get a full start or stop menu screen. You used your phone and were able to go up and down and select stuff. Uh, again, this was a very much an immersive uh, solution to handling that. So what do all the slides, except for Age of Empires and Pong and ET have in common? Uh, <laughs> they use the following four things. Uh, this, the use of color to show uh, like and unlike uh, actions or grouped items. They use labels where they can, where it makes sense. Their consistent placement throughout each of the in each of the games where you're expecting when you're playing a fighting game, you're expecting to see some sort of life meter at the top or bottom of the screen. And you're using animation where possible to infer information. That's it.